So I'm excited to be here today to talk to you about software in the era of AI. And I'm told that many of you are students, like bachelor's, master's, PhD, and so on, and you're about to enter the industry. And I think it's actually like an extremely unique and very interesting time to enter the industry right now. And I think fundamentally the reason for that is that um, software is changing uh, again. <laughs> and I say again because I actually gave this talk already. Um, but the problem is that software keeps changing, so I actually have a lot of material to create new talks. And I think it's changing quite fundamentally. I think, roughly speaking, software has not changed much on such a fundamental level for 70 years. And then it's changed, I think, about twice quite rapidly in the last few years. And so there's just a huge amount of work to do, a huge amount of software to write and rewrite. So let's take a look at uh, maybe the realm of software. So if we kind of think of this as like the map of software, this is a really cool tool called Map of GitHub. Um, this is kind of like all the software that's written. Uh, these are instructions to the computer for carrying out tasks in the digital space. So if you zoom in here, these are all different kinds of repositories, and this is all the code that has been written. And a few years ago, I kind of observed that um, software was kind of changing, and there was kind of like a new, so new type of software around, and I called this Software 2.0 at the time. And the idea here was that uh, Software 1.0 is the code you write for the computer. Software 2.0 are basically neural networks, and in particular, the weights of a neural network. And you're not writing this code directly. You are, most, you are more kind of like tuning the data sets, and then you're running an optimizer to, pre to create the parameters of this neural net. So basically what we have is software 1.0 is the computer code that programs a computer. Software 2.0 are the weights which program neural networks. And I think what's changed, and I think is a quite fundamental change, is that neural networks became programmable with la large language models. And so I, I see this as quite new, unique. It's a new kind of a computer. And uh, so in my mind, it's uh, worth giving it a new designation of software 3.0. And basically, your prompts are now programs that program the LLM. And uh, remarkably, uh, these uh, prompts are written in English. So it's kind of a very interesting programming language. And I think we're seeing, uh, maybe you've seen a lot of GitHub code is not just like code anymore. There's a bunch of like English interspersed with code. And so I think kind of there's a growing category of new kind of code. So not only is it a new programming paradigm, it's also remarkable to me that it's in our native language of English. And so when this blew my mind uh, a few, uh, I guess, years ago now, uh, I tweeted this, and um, I think it captured the attention of a lot of people, and this is my currently pinned tweet, uh, is that remarkably we're now programming computers in English. Now, when I was at uh, Tesla, um, we were working on the uh, autopilot, and uh, we were trying to get the car to drive. And I sort of showed this slide at the time, where you can imagine that the inputs to the car are on the bottom, and they're going through a software stack to produce the steering and acceleration. And I made the observation at the time that there was a ton of C++ code around in the autopilot, which was the software 1.0 code, and then there was some neural nets in there doing image recognition. And uh, I kind of observed that over time, as we made the autopilot better, basically the neural network grew in capability and size, and in addition to that, all the C++ code was being deleted and kind of like was, um, uh, and a lot of the kind of ca capabilities and functionality that was originally written in 1.0 was migrated to 2.0. So as an example, a lot of the stitching up of information across images from the different cameras and across time was done by a neural network and we were able to delete a lot of code. And so the software 2.0 stack quite literally ate through the software stack of the autopilot. So I thought this was really remarkable at the time. And I think we're seeing the same thing again. First, I want to, in the first part, talk about LLMs and how to kind of like think of this new paradigm and the ecosystem and what that looks like. Uh, like what, are, what is this new computer? What does it look like? And what does the ecosystem look like? Um, I was struck by this quote from Andrew Ng actually uh, many years ago now, AI is the new electricity. And I do think that it um, kind of captures something very interesting in that LLMs certainly feel like they have properties of utilities right now. So, um, LLM labs like OpenAI, Gemini, Anthropy, et cetera, they spend CapEx to train the LLMs, and this is kind of equivalent to building out a grid, and then there's OpEx to serve that intelligence over APIs to all of us. And this is done through metered access where we pay per million tokens or something like that. And I think what's also a little fascinating, and we saw this in the last few days actually, a lot of the LLMs went down and people were kind of like stuck and unable to work. <laughs> And uh, I think it's kind of fascinating to me that when the state-of-the-art LLMs go down, it's actually kind of like an intelligence brownout in the world. 
It's kind of like when the voltage is unreliable in the grid and uh, the planet just gets dumber, <laughs> the more reliance we have on these models, which already is like really dramatic and I think will continue to grow. So the way I like to think about LLMs is that they're kind of like people spirits. And because it is trained on humans, it's got this emergent psychology that is human-like. So the first thing you'll notice is, of course, <clears throat> uh, LLMs have encyclopedic knowledge and memory, uh, and they can remember lots of things, a lot more than any single individual human can because they've read so many things. So they certainly have superpowers in some, set, in some respects, but they also have a bunch of, I would say, cognitive uh, deficits. So they hallucinate quite a bit, um, and they kind of make up stuff and don't have a very good uh, sort of internal model of self-knowledge, uh, not sufficient at least. And this has gotten better, but not perfect. They display jagged intelligence. So they're gonna be superhuman in some problem-solving domains, and then they're gonna make mistakes that basically no human will make. Like, <clears throat> you know, they will insist that 9.11 is greater than 9.9, .9, or that there are two R's in strawberry. These are some famous examples. But basically there are rough edges that you can trip on. So that's kind of, I think, also kind of unique. Uh, they also kind of suffer from anterograde amnesia. Um, so, uh, and I think I'm alluding to the fact that if you have a coworker who joins your organization, this coworker will over time learn your organization and uh, they will understand and gain like a huge amount of context on the organization and they go home and they sleep and they consolidate knowledge and they develop expertise over time. LLMs don't natively do this and this is not something that has really been solved in the R&D of LLMs, I think security uh, kind of related limitations of the use of LLMs. So for example, LLMs are quite gullible. Uh, they are susceptible to prompt injection risks. They might leak your data, et cetera. And so, um, and there's many other considerations uh, security related. So, so basically, long story short, you have to load your, um, you have to load your, you have to simultaneously think through this superhuman thing that has a bunch of cognitive deficits and issues. How do we, and yet, they are extremely like useful I wanna now switch gears a little bit and talk about one other dimension that I think is very unique. Not only is there a new type of programming language that allows for autonomy in software, but also, as I mentioned, it's programmed in English, which is this natural interface. And suddenly, everyone is a programmer because everyone speaks natural language like English. So this is extremely bullish and very interesting to me and also completely unprecedented, I would say. It, it used to be the case that you need to spend five to 10 years studying something to be able to do something in software. This is not the case anymore. So I don't know if by any chance anyone has heard of vibe coding. <laughs> uh, this, this is the tweet that kind of like introduced this, but I'm told that this is now like a major meme. Um, fun story about this is that I've been on Twitter for like 15 years or something like that at this point, and I still have no clue which tweet will become viral and which tweet like fizzles and no one cares. And I thought that uh, this tweet was gonna be the latter. I don't know, it was just like a shower of thoughts. But this became like a total meme, and I really just can't tell. But I guess like it struck a chord and it gave a name to something that everyone was feeling but couldn't quite say in words. So now there's a Wikipedia page and everything. <laughs> this is like... <laughs> yeah, this is like a major contribution now or something like that, so... Um, so Tom Wolf from Hugging Face shared this beautiful video that I really love. Um, yeah. These are kids vibe coding. <laughs> and I find that this is such a wholesome video. Like, I love this video. Like, how can you look at this video and feel bad about the future? The future is great. <laughs> I think this will end up being like a gateway drug to software development. Uh, I'm not a doomer about the future of the generation. And I think, yeah, I love this video. So I tried vibe coding a little bit uh, as well because it's so fun. Uh, so vibe coding is so great when you wanna build something super duper custom that doesn't appear to exist and you just wanna wing it because it's a Saturday or something like that. So I built this uh, iOS app and I don't, uh, I can't actually program in Swift, but I was really shocked that I was able to build like a super basic app and I'm not gonna explain it, it's really uh, dumb, but uh, I kind of like, this was just like a day of work and this was running on my phone like later that day and I was like, wow, this is amazing. I didn't have to like read through Swift for like uh, five days or something like that to like get started. And then it took me a week because I was trying to make it real. And the reason for this is this was just really annoying. Um, so for example, if you try to add Google login to your web page, I know this is very small, but just a huge amount of instructions of this uh, clerk library telling me how to integrate this. And this is crazy, like it's telling me, go to this URL, Click on this drop-down, 
choose this, go to this, and click on that, and it's like telling me what to do. Like a computer is telling me <laughs> the actions I should be taking. Like, you do it. Why am I doing this? <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> I had to follow all these instructions. This was crazy. So I think the last part of my talk, therefore, focuses on can we just build for agents? I don't want to do this work. Can agents do this? Thank you. <laughs> okay. So roughly speaking, I think there's a new category of consumer and manipulator of digital information. It used to be just humans through GUIs or computers through APIs, and now we have a completely new thing. And agents, are, they're computers, but they are human-like, kind of, right? They're people spirits. There's people spirits on the internet, and they need to interact with our software infrastructure. Like, can we build for them? It's a new thing. So as an example, you can have robots.txt on your domain, and you can instruct uh, or like advise, I suppose, um, uh, web crawlers on how to behave on your website. In the same way, you can have maybe LLMs.txt file, which is just a simple markdown that's telling LLMs what this domain is about. So if we can make docs legible to LLMs, it's going to unlock a huge amount of um, kind of use. It is absolutely possible that in the future, uh, LLMs will be able to, this is not even future, this is today, they'll be able to go around and they'll be able to click stuff and so on. But I still think it's very worth uh, basically meeting LLM halfway, LLMs halfway, and making it easier for them to access all this information. Uh, but I think for everyone else, I think it's very worth kind of like meeting in some middle point. So I'm bullish on both, if that makes sense. So in summary, what an amazing time to get into the industry. We need to rewrite a ton of code. A ton of code will be written by professionals and by coders. Um, and these LLMs are kind of like these fallible, uh, you know, people spirits that we have to learn to work with. And in order to do that properly, we need to adjust our infrastructure towards it. And then, um, yeah, a lot of code has to also be written for the agents more directly. But in any case, going back to the Iron Man suit analogy, I think what we'll see over the next decade, roughly, is we're going to take the slider from left to right, and I'm very interesting, it's gonna be very interesting to see what that looks like, and I can't wait to build it with all of you. Thank you. <laughs>